Then hello everyone, my name is Michał and uh, I'm from a Polish company called GrapeUp, where we specialize in cloud and AI technologies. Uh, I'm an AWS uh, certified solutions architect and today we're going to talk about uh, AWS infrastructure. So the goal of this presentation is to create a real life AWS architecture, which will be able to host a, host a user manager system consisting of a React.js front-end application for which uh, the view you can see right now on the presentation, a Spring Boot backend server and a, a relational database. So our infrastructure will comprise four subnets, two public and two private, distributed uh, in two different availability zones for high availability. In public subnets, uh, we'll host our client uh, application and the NAT gateway, while in our private subnets, we'll uh, host backend server and RDS database. Uh, our infrastructure will also include an internet gateway in order to grant access to the internet from our VPC, a public facing application load balancer for high availability. And along the way, we'll use AWS system manager uh, in order to access our instances. So I divided the process of creating the infrastructure into three stages. First one is architecture scaffolding, where we'll deal with setup of the VPC, subnets, NAT gateway, and configuration of routing tables. Uh, then we'll work on a virtual machine, a database setup. So we'll create EC2 instances, we'll use AMI images and configure our RDS database. And in the end, we'll work on load balancing and we'll deploy and run our applications. So first let's start with what is virtual private cloud or in other, uh, as a short name VPC. Uh, it's an isolated virtual network, which is a part of the AWS network in which we can launch our AWS resources. And within the VPC, our resources have private IP addresses through which they can communicate with one another. We can control the access to all those resources inside the VPC and route outgoing traffic however we like. Uh, however, we cannot launch EC2 instances directly into the VPC. We need for that subnets. So subnets are additional isolated areas uh, that have its own CIDR block and routing policies. Uh, and uh, we can launch instances inside the subnets. Uh, subnets allow us to create different behaviors in the same VPC. For instance, we can create a public subnet that can be accessed and can have access directly to the internet, the outside world. And we can have a private subnet, which is not accessible from the internet and has access to the internet only through the NAT gateway. So network address translation gateway. Now let's move to the fun part. So, AWS Management Console. In top right corner, we can select an AWS region. AWS regions are geographical areas in which AWS has its data, data centers. Uh, and regions are further divided into availability zones, uh, which are independent data centers relatively close to each other, which are used for redundancy and data replication. So in my case, I'm using EOS one. It doesn't matter for this presentation, but it might matter for your organization, for instance, due to privacy policies. So as I said before, we're gonna start with scaffolding of our application. So first we'll set up the VPC. We're going to the VPC service dashboard and we're gonna click launch VPC wizard. Uh, so as I said before, we're gonna have two public and two private subnets. So from here we can select the uh, uh, setup which resembles the most our target architecture, which is VPC with public and private subnets. Uh, here we can specify details of our virtual private cloud, such as CIDR block. I'm going to decrease this a bit. Uh, VPC name, I'm going to name it user manager VPC. And we can configure uh, subnets for one of our availability zones. So we'll start with availability zone A. Uh, word name, public subnet, public subnet A, and private subnet, private subnet A. So as I mentioned before, in order to have access to the internet from our private subnets, we need a NAT gateway. 
Uh, AWS provides us with a managed NAT gateway service. We just need to allocate Elastic IP address for it. So we're going to go to another tab, once again, to the VPC service dashboard. Mm, and we'll go to the Elastic IP tab. Here we can all allocate Elastic IP. Elastic IP is just a static IP address which is managed by AWS, and we can use it to we can attach it and disattach it from our resources freely. Uh, so that's where its elasticity comes from. For instance, if if one of our resources fails, we can simply attach it to a healthy one. So I'm going to allocate one Elastic IP right now, and I'm going to change its name to NAT A IP. Now, if we go back to the first step, we should see our Elastic IP again selected. We have some other options here, such, such as, for instance, dedicated hardware, but that's very costly and we don't need that for this presentation. So I'm going to just click Create VPC. And right now, AWS is going to uh, configure our VPC. Uh, if we go to the VPC dashboard, we'll already see it. Uh, the part which takes the most is the configuration of NAT gateway. So if we go to NAT gateways, we'll see that the NAT gateway is being in the pending state. So we can work, uh, wait wait for it. But in the meantime, we can configure the availability zone B. And in order to do that, we need to create manually subnets in that availability zone. So I'm going to click Create Subnet, select our VPC. Uh, I think it's not our VPC, is it? One moment. That's the VPC IP. It seems like my name didn't user manager PPC didn't save. So okay. And here same. Okay, so maybe it's still creating in the meantime. Uh, we can talk about the security in the uh, VPC. So security inside the VPC can be managed with use of three key structures, which is security groups, network access control lists, knuckles, and route tables. Security groups work like mini firewalls. They define allowed incoming and outgoing traffic, and they work on instance level and can be shared among many instances and allow access from other security groups. At the same time, we can use knuckles, which are IP filtering table for incoming and outgoing traffic. And they work as an additional security la layer on top of the security groups. And the difference is that they work on VPC or subnet level instead of instance level, and they support deny rules. So we can use it, for instance, for blacklisting specific IPs. Then uh, as a third measure, we have route tables, which allow to determine where the traffic from subnet or gateway should be directed. And each VPC has its main route table, and we can define custom route tables for our subnets and gateways. So let's go back to the VPC management. Yes, OK, so I can see that that wasn't mine. Now we have the public subnet. We have user manager VPC. So now we can create our subnets in second availability zone. So let's select our VPC. We're going to name it public subnet B. We want to place it in availability zone B. And we need to define its CIDR block, which needs to be a subset of the CIDR block of our VPC. So that should work. And we can create. Now we can do the same for our private subnet B. And 0 0.3.0 and T4. And create subnet. Uh, so now we have all the subnets we need. We can move to creation of NAT gateway for the second availability zone, and we also need to do that manually. So we're going to click create NAT gateway, name it NAT B. Uh, now we want to place it in public subnet B, and we need to allocate another Elastic IP address for it. That's it. The last step in uh, infrastructure in our part of infrastructure scaffolding is setup of routing rules. So we're going to move to route tables, and we can see that AWS set us up with two route tables as default. We have the main route table and some additional one. So we're start with main routing table. We're going to name it main RT. And we're going to use our main route table uh, for our public subnets. 
both subnets will have the same routing policies. So we'll just associate it with public subnet A and public subnet B. Now we can uh, look at uh, the routing rules, edit routes. And we have two entries here. The first one says that each IP address, which is part of the PPC CIDR block, should resolve locally, and that's fine for us. And the second one redirects the outgoing traffic through the NAT gateway. And in case of the public subnet, we want to go through the internet gateway. So we're going to change that. Now, the second route table we're going to use for our private uh, A. Uh, subnet, so private ART, I'm going to name it, and I'm going to associate it with private subnet A. Private subnet A. Here we go. Now we're also going to edit the routing rules. And in this case, as it's a, for this private subnet, we want to uh, redirect traffic through the NAT gateway. So uh, we don't have the name here, but if that's not B, then that's the A. So we can use it. And we need another routing table for private subnet B. So let's click create route table, name it private B RT. We want it to be part of our user manager VPC. Create. Now we want to associate it with private subnet B. Oh, I changed the association of private ART, so I'm going to just redo that. And now I need to change here and association with private subnet B. And again, routing rules. Uh, we need to add a routing rule for outgoing traffic to go to NAT B gateway this time. So that's basically it. Oh, we have the name, so I'm not sure. Oh, OK. This one already has the name, so I'm going to just rename it and add here the name, not A. So let's go back to the presentation for now. So we finished our infrastructure scaffolding part. We have four subnets in two different availability zones, uh, together with a NAT gateways in both uh, ability zones. So the next step is going to be set up of our virtual machines and a database. So let's go back to the AWS Management Console. And now we're going to move to the EC2 service dashboard. So EC2 is an abbreviation for Elastic Cloud Compute Cloud. And it's simply a virtual machine provisioned with a certain amount of resources, such as CPU, memory, storage, network capacity launched in a selected AWS region and availability zone and managed by AWS. The elasticity in the name means that you can scale up or down resources easily depending on your needs and requirements. So we're going to start with setup of an instance for our backend server in availability zone A. So I'm going to cl click launch instance. Uh, here we can choose an Amazon Machine Image, AMI. Uh, Amazon Machine Images are basically image templates that contain software operating system, runtime environments, and our actual applications that are used to launch uh, EC2 instances. And we can use some pre-configured AWS AMIs, such as here, or we can have our own AMIs. For now, I'm going to use just the basic Amazon Linux 2 AMI, but later on, we also use our own. So I'm going to click TA. Here we can select instance type. I'm going with 2.2 micro, which is part of free tier. And here we can specify the details of our EC2 instance. So this is instance for the backend server in the big zone A. So I want to place it in private subnet A. We don't need public IP for private subnet. Uh, I pre-configured two uh, IAM roles, server EC2 role and client EC2 role. And they basically provide our instances with access to some other AWS services, such as system manager, session manager, parameter store, uh, etc. Uh, so one more thing we should like to do is use the user data script. User data script is the script which is executed during the boot up of our EC2 instance. And I uh, prepared a script here 
which will basically uh, install Java 11 and uh, download the jar file of our backend application from AWS S3 service. AWS S3 service is a file source service which we use to store our jar file right now. So I'm going to click uh, next. Mm, one, oops, next. Uh, here we can configure storage of our EC2 instance, uh, but we can go with the default settings. And I like to add a name tag to my instances. Name, so server A EC2. And here we can configure security group. So I'm going to create a new security group, which I'm going to name server SG. And we're going to SG for servers. We're going to use the same security group for both, both our server instances. Uh, by default, uh, security groups allow access on SSH port, uh, but we don't need that because we'll use AWS Session Manager in order to access our instance if we want SSH to them directly. We can go further and review our instance details and click launch. Here, AWS asks us for a keeper because it uses a public private key cryptography uh, during uh, in order to SSH into the instance. But as I said, we're not going to SSH to it, so we don't need a keeper. Launch instance. Uh, and it's being launched. It's going to take a moment. So in the meantime, we can create an EC2 instance for abilities on A for client application. So I'm going to click launch, launch instance again, select the same, same MMI, Amazon Linux 2, same instance type. Uh, this time we wanted to uh, our EC2 instance to be deployed in public subnet A, so that's fine. In public subnet, we need a uh, public IP, so I'm going to enable it. I'm going to select client EC2 role. And we also need a user data script, but this time a bit different. So this time, this this EC2 instance is going to run a front-end application. So we need a Node.js and Git. We'll use Git to fetch the repository later on. We're also using default storage setup. I'm going to add the name tab, client A EC2. And I'm going to create a new security group, client SG. We also don't need the SSH port to open. Review and launch. Again, we don't need a keeper. We can proceed without it. So now we are uh, both our instances and abilities on A are being created. Uh, when they finally get created, uh, we will be able to. As, uh, use session manager in order to connect to them. Uh, the way I check if the instance was already created because the state is already running, but it doesn't mean that it was fully configured. I usually go to system lock. And if here the system lock appears, that means that the instance was fully configured. So uh, as we can see, it hasn't yet. Uh, so after we configure the instance manual here, we could do exactly the same process for abilities on B, but uh, we can also create an MMI image, which we would do through instance settings, uh, no, uh, image and template, create image. Uh, but that takes a while, so I already did that. And we're just going to use our pre-created MMIs to launch instances and in ability zone B. So I'm going to first use server MMI to launch server instance in ability zone B. Uh, this one already contains the jar and Java. We just need to place it in the proper uh, subnet. So this time it's going to be private subnet B. Again, we don't need public IP. We need IRM ROM servers to IRM role. And this time we don't need the user data script because we already have uh, the runtime environment prepared in our Amazon machine image. Again, default uh, storage name server B EC2. And we use an existing security group, so it's the server SG. Again, we can proceed without a keeper. And now we're going to do exactly the same process for client 
uh, server in every bit zone B. So this time we want to place public subnet B, uh, enable public IP, client is literal. Again, we don't need the user data script because it's already part of Amazon machine image. Name client uh, B is it we're going to use the client security group. Proceed with our keeper, launch instance. In the meantime, we can check if our instance is ever be on A or are ready. So again, get system lock. Yes, so the uh, server A C2 is ready. So now we can use connect and use session manager in order to get access to our AWS instance. So here we have the uh, terminal session. Uh, so here we can see that our jar file is present. I'm going to move it to uh, user manager to the home directory SM user. Home SSM user. And I'm going to verify that we have Java present. Yes, we do. So that's it. That instance is ready. Instances. We don't need to do the same for server BC2 because this was already part of our MI. So we also need to prepare client AEC2. So we're going to connect to it. We're going to make sure that we have node installed. Yes, it is. We can go home, system user. And this time we're going to clone our repository. Uh, I need the URL that's here. And we're just going to run npm install in order not to have to do it later on. That can happen in background. Go back to our instances and make see if uh, instances able to B were also configured. Mm, not yet. Okay. In the meantime, we can set up our uh, database. So we'll go back to the AWS Management Console, find RDS. RDS is a rational database service. So it's an AWS service for creating rational databases managed by the AWS. So we don't have to care for instance about the underlying infrastructure. I'll just click create database. Mm. And he here we have different engine options. Amazon Aurora is supposed to be the fastest and the cheapest one. Uh, but in this presentation, I'm going to use MySQL because it provides a free tier option. So here we have some database settings. I'm going to make a user. I'm going to name it user manager DB. Uh, credential settings, I will set our secure admin123 password, 123. Uh, storage, we are fine with the default settings. Here, if we didn't use the free tier, we could enable multi-LZ deployment. Uh, we can't right now, but we will be able to do it after the database is created in the edit option. So uh, here, we want it to be part of our user manager VPC. Uh, we don't need public access and we'd like to create a new security group user manager db sg we can place it in ability zone a in c some we don't want to change the port and here we have some additional configurations such as the default database name so user manager db we don't need automatic backups and that's it. We can click create database. Okay, that's going to take a while. So let's go back to our EC2 instances and see if they are ready. Uh, server BC2 actions. Let's system lock. Oh, it's almost ready. Okay. Uh, it's same for client BC2. Client BC2 is ready, so we can first access it. 
and verify that everything is as expected. So if we this time go to com some user, we should have here the application. Yes, we do. Uh, and we should have node installed uh, dash dash version. Yes, we have. Okay, so the EC2 instance uh, for client application in availability zone B is ready. Uh, let's hope that this one also got set up. No, yeah. So now we can also connect to client B EC2. Mm, we'll move to home, system user, and just verify that our jar is there. It is. So our EC2 instances are prepared. Uh, our database is probably still being prepared, but we can verify that. We don't need that tab anymore. It takes a while to load the service. DB instances. Yeah, it's still being created. When it gets created, here we'll get the endpoint port, which we'll be able to use to connect to it. So in the meantime, let's go back to our presentation. Uh, we can talk a bit about the EC2 storage. So all EC2 instances come with instant store volumes for temporary data that is deleted whenever the instance is stopped or terminated, as well as with elastic block store. So that's the part which we're always going with the default setting, but we could change it, which is a pers persistent storage volume working independently of the EC2 instance itself. Uh, there's also a third option, which is Elastic File System, which is file storage service. And this one can be shared among many instances. So here we can look at the summary of what we've done in this stage. We uh, configured our EC2 instances, uh, uh, used AMIs to configure instances in second availability zone, and we uh, configured our relational database. So that's where we are with our infrastructure right now. The next step is uh, the setup of load balancing and the deployment of our applications. So let's go back to the AWS management service. In the meantime, we can, this one is still creating, that's not a problem. So we're gonna go to the EC2 service dashboard again. And we're gonna scroll a bit. Here we have the load balancing tab. So the load balancing in AWS works with use of target groups. Uh, target groups allow us to define a set of targets that are supposed to handle traffic of the same type. Then each uh, load balancer uh, has a set of listeners uh, that consists of request conditions, such as, for instance, at this port, all the requests at the specific port we'd like to uh, forward to a specific target group. So first we're gonna set up our target groups. We'll have two target groups, one for server instances and one for client instances. Uh, we can see that the target groups can uh, have instances of targets, IP addresses, or Lambda functions. In our case, it's going to be instances, so uh, server TG. Our application is going to be running on port 8080, so we'll change that. It's part of our user manager BPC. And health check path, our application doesn't have that base path, so we're going to use users path. Next. And here we can specify instances which should be part of our target group. So I'm going to select server A and server B C2 instance, include the spending. And I'm going to create target group. Now we're going to do the same for client target group, client TG. Mm, our client application runs in port 5000. Uh, it's also going to be user manager VPC. This time we have the, uh, the base path, so we don't have to change that and client AEC2 and client BC2 as target instances. Perfect. We can move to the setup of load balancer. So create load balancer. Uh, here we have different load balancer types. A uh, classic load balancer is basically legacy solution. Uh, application load balancer is used for regular HTTP and HTTPS traffic, and network load balancer is for lower level traffic. To be honest, I'm not sure what's a gateway load balancer. That's a new thing. Uh, so I'm going to name our load balancer. We're going to use application load balancer, and I'm going to name it user manager LB. Uh, it's supposed to be internet facing. 
um, and it's supposed to have two listeners, uh, one on port 8080, another one on port 5000 for both our applications. We wanted in both uh, public subnet A and public subnet B. We don't need any specific configuration. He will create a new security group for our load balancer. So user manager LB SG, SG for load balancer. And this one allows traffic, incoming traffic on port 8080 and 5000 from everywhere. That's fine. Uh, configure routing. So here we can select an existing target group. We're going to select server TG uh, and we'll have to configure uh, client target group later on manually. So register target, the targets of our target group, and create. We created our load balancer. If we, if we go to the listeners tab, we can see that both listeners right now forward traffic to server TG. We need to edit that role. Uh, that process is not very user-friendly. A lot of clicks for a simple thing, but here we go. I think, yeah, so now the listener port 5000 is forwarding traffic to client TG and the listener port uh, 8080 is uh, forwarding traffic to the server TG. That's what we want. Uh, in meantime, I hope that our ration database got configured. So let's go back there. Yeah, the status is available, so we can click on it. And here we have the endpoint, which we'll use to connect to the database. So um, our backend application is a Spring Boot application. And during the startup, it's going to try to uh, connect to AWS uh, System Manager, uh, which we're going to use as a config server. So during the startup, our application is going to try to fetch configuration from the parameter store. I pre-configured here some uh, configuration properties such as username. In our case, it was admin uh, password, admin123. And we have the URL which need to edit to point to our database. So we need to change this part, save changes. And now when our application uh, boots up, it should be able to uh, connect to the database. So let's go back to the EC2. Uh, the last part before we run our applications is we need to configure, make some changes to our security groups. So first thing in our server security group, we need to edit inbound roles. Uh, and we need to add a role to allow traffic on point 8080 from, our, from the security group of our load balancer. so that our load balancer occur, can forward traffic to the uh, server instances. The same for client SG, but instead of port 8080, we're gonna use port 5000 and as well user manager LBSG. Save. Uh, the last thing is uh, the user manager DB security group into edit in controls and we need to allow uh, traffic on the MySQL port so it's uh, 3306 uh, for the server security group so that our server instances can connect uh, to the database. That's it. Now we should be able to run our instances. So first I'm going to connect to both server, server A and server B, EC2 instances. script so we'll go to this home uh there i go home system user here we have our jar file so i'm gonna use the uh, command uh, so first i just kill uh, any process which is running uh, and using port 8080 then i export spring profile uh, as production profile uh, and i run the jar uh, our application through execution of the jar file and in the end, I just disown the process so that whenever we kill this terminal, the process doesn't die. We'll do the same for both. Uh, oh, here I also need to move to the 
سم Now the application, yeah. So our Spring application is booting up. Yeah, so it started successfully. Uh, So now we can try to start, and we can see that there is already some traffic. This is the traffic from the load balancer. So that's expected. Uh, now we're going to move to the client instances, client A instance, connect, and client B C2, connect, and we'll start our uh, front end applications. So again, CD home SSM user. CD home SSM user. Uh, we'll go to inside our application user, and here we'll need the uh, URL of our backend server, which is equivalent to the URL of our load balancer, which you can take from the load balancer details. Uh, this is this one. I'm just gonna put it. Uh, so now let me go here. Uh, I prepared some uh, simple script deployed at SSH, which basically installs all the node dependencies and runs the React application. Here, as a parameter, we pass the address of the backend server, which is the load balancer URL with the port 8080 and we again design the process so and same here uh, if we go to the target groups and server TG we have our targets and the load balancer automatically performs health checks so at some point it should change the targets to healthy there's a delay so I guess that's why we don't see that yet, but it should happen soon. Mm. But actually, if we uh, just go here and try to access the URL of our backend server, we get the empty array. That means that the backend server is running. And now if we try to access the application for 5,000, we still talk about gateways. So that means that our application didn't. Okay, this one didn't yet start. We need to wait a moment. Uh, in general, the load balancer should forward traffic only to health instances, but that only happens if any of the instances is already marked as healthy. And uh, because of the delay, both of the instances are unhealthy. So right now the load balancer is in a pass through mode and just forwarding the uh, request to all the targets. Let's check out again. Yeah, now we can see that our server target group instances are marked as healthy. And that's it, our application is running. We can create a user. So I'm gonna use my details. Use some fake password. One, two, three, four, nine, three. Okay. So we managed to save our user. Uh, if we go back to the uh, to our backend instances and we kill our instances, mm, if you save this one, uh, in both cases. We'll see that our user disappears, but if we recreate the instances, relaunch them. Oh, something is annoying. 
we should get back to our user because we're using a persistent database. So let's wait for it to boot up. There are some warnings, but doesn't matter. And now we have our user back. Uh, so that's it. We created an AWS infrastructure comprising of four subnets into different availability zones. We deployed our client application and a backend server. We configured an relational database with use of RDA's AWS service. Uh, we use a NAT gateway. Uh, we configured application load balancer, and along the way, we used AWS System Manager to access our instances. So thank you very much. Here, uh, here are the URLs of the backend application code, front-end application code, and cloud formation for the infrastructure. Uh, the cloud formation templates were not created by me, but uh, by my colleague. Uh, but feel free to check it out if you need. Uh, what are the top tips on debugging VPC connectivity issue? Where do you find that things are usually misconfigured? Uh, so usually it's in security groups or routing rules, uh, I would say. And for debugging, that means on what stage we are. If we already have running applications, we can use, and we have logging, a logging in our applications, we can use AWS X-Ray or uh, CloudWatch. But in most, most cases, when it comes to connectivity, it's security groups or routing or eventual network access control list. So all the security measures we have.